So I use social media for a number of reasons, but I'm always using it to pitch the property and not myself. You know, there are a lot of very successful real estate brokers out there who've done really well in leveraged television shows, and I give them a lot of credit and bravo to all of them. But they're really out there promoting themselves and not their properties. My philosophy is promote your properties and they'll sell. So I take a different approach. And again, bravo to their success, but they're out there creating content on a daily basis. What they do, they're content creators. Are they really out there trying to get their listings sold? I don't think so. I think they're trying to get themselves sold. And I think if you if you truly promote your properties, you will be promoting yourself at the same time. Welcome to 3D Media Live Podcast. I'm your host, Dimitri, and I have a very, very special guest today, it's uh, uh, my good friend, Sean Elliott, one of the greatest real estate agents in North America, maybe in the world. Uh, we worked together for quite a, quite some time now, and I'm very proud and privileged to have him in our podcast. It's going to be a really, really fun discussion we're going to have today. And I'd love to learn a little bit more about Sean's life in general and his business practice. There's going to be a lot to learn for Anybody that's very much interested in, even remotely in real estate, especially luxury real estate, uh, Sean has sold some of the most expensive properties in the world, and he has a lot of great things to share with us. Welcome, Sean. Hey, thank you, Dimitri. Great to see you, and um, thank you for that amazing introduction. Great to have you here. Uh, so yeah, we've, we've known each other for a few years now. We started off listing uh, great properties. Uh, I've assisted you with all the media content marketing and uh one listing that you have currently right now in the market that i felt to is 1200 bel air which is 139 million i believe it's probably one of the most if not the most expensive one in in southern california is that right yeah it's the second most expensive home for sale in the united states the most expensive home for sale in the u.s right now is right down the road on uh, bellagio casa and cantata i did have that listing uh, years back before COVID, it's back on the market at 195. You never know; you may be seeing me part of that soon as well. Um, it is a trophy property, 1200 Bel Air Road. It is uh, a one of a kind. It's really a modern masterpiece, and there's nothing else like it anywhere uh, in Southern California. I don't think there's anything like it anywhere in the world. I, I I agree with you. I've been there personally. It's uh, it's quite remarkable. Like just chandeliers alone, I believe, like north of four million dollars, and just correct the, the attention to detail there is unbelievable. Yeah, the fit and finish of that house is like a Fed ship or a Lurson. And if you don't know much about mega yachts, a Lurson and a Fed ship are like the Rolls Royce and Bentley of yachting. And the interior of this house doesn't have one inch of drywall. It's absolutely amazing. All the walls are finished either in a natural stone or some type of amazing uh, finished, like I would say, uh, some type of Venetian plaster or just above and beyond wall coverings. I've really never seen anything quite like it. So before we talk more about 1200 Bel Air, I actually want to know a little bit more about your life, how you got into real estate, because you've been doing this for many, many years now. And from from my perspective, I mean, I think it's pretty universal knowledge. You're definitely one of the top agents in the world. Uh, some of the listings that I remember you had $250 million. It was the most expensive listing at the time. Was it 924? What was the address? 924 Bel Air Road. 924 Bel Air. That's right. That was listed at $250 million, correct? It started at 250 a couple of price reductions along the way. Timing wasn't perfect, but the house was absolutely perfect ultimate sale price 102 million dollars wow so how did you get in this position where people are trusting you with uh these one-of-a-kind incredible pieces of real estate we work with thousands and thousands of agents and i know from almost every agent they they aspire to reach this this type of uh level where they can list 100 plus million dollar homes how long has it taken you to get to this point so it starts with one you just need one. And from from that one success, you get bragging rights and it takes you to the next one and the next one and the next one. So it started 20 years ago for me. I got my license in actually 2002. So it's 22 years that I'm in the business of real estate. Before real estate, I was in fashion. 
I built a beautiful mid-sized boutique firm in New York, 150 agents, six offices, and our niche was always luxury. Now, luxury has a different definition to a lot of people. Luxury today could be a million and a half, $2 million house. Back in the day, we considered luxury to be more like five or 10 million. And then 25 and up is truly ultra luxury. But I, myself and my team and my agents in, in New York sort of mastered the luxury market. We had huge competition with Sotheby's and Christie's and Douglas Elliman. And back then, you know, as today, we take no hostages. We are 100% um, aggressive, relentless, tenacious in, a, in, in securing inventory at that level. We started to become so good that uh, we would eat all of our competitors lunch <laughs> on a daily basis. And at that point, it wasn't enough for me. And I got very fortunate to meet the developer of that 924 Bel Air Road at his house in New York. I sold him the house probably somewhere around 20 years ago, but resold it for him back in 2012. 2013. And that sale was a record breaking sale in that immediate area. We were around $11 million on that deal. But for Oyster Bay, Upper Brookville, the area that we practice real estate in, it was a huge um, success. And that kind of like made waves all over the North Shore. When the house was probably worth back then, maybe seven, eight, nine million dollars maximum, my client didn't believe I would achieve north of nine million. And I said, watch me. And essentially the buyer came from mainland China. I saw the trend in the early 2010, 11, 12. I saw the trend of very wealthy mainland Chinese coming to places like New York, Seattle, Portland, Vancouver, uh, San Diego. And instead of waiting for the Chinese to come to me, I got on a plane and I went to Beijing. And then before you, before you know it, I was in Shanghai and Guangzhou and Shenzhen and meeting the ultra rich and bringing these families back to the U S and this particular deal was amazing because I really did seek out that buyer for this house in, um, actually, believe it or not, the address was one Bel Air court in New York, in upper Brookville. The fact that that's Bel Air court, I ended up selling a house on Bel Air road and now I have a second listing over a hundred million. It's kind of weird, but I'll tell you that, um, it was all about presentation. And I picked up the client at Kennedy Airport. They came in from Shanghai. They came in Cathay Pacific, which is- When was this? Important. What year? This is probably 2013, 14, in that range, so about 10 years ago. I had, um, again, they flew in to New York's JFK, Cathay Pacific, and I'm sure they flew in first class. And I picked them up in a Rolls Royce Phantom. Nice. At that time, a Phantom was a $400,000 car. And I picked them up in style. And on the back seat of the car, I had two boxes from Tiffany's and they were keys and they were necklaces. And I remember the husband and wife, you know, didn't expect to be picked up in style like that. And they drove the 45 minute drive to Upper Brookfield to one Bel Air Court. And when the gates opened, I had the driveway, almost like people talk about eye candy. Um, you know, I had the driveway uh, and the garage all set up with garage candy. If you entered the, the gates, and I have photos of this, I'd love to share with you. But once you enter the gates, we had strategically placed the Brigati in the center above the fountain, to the right and the left, two Aston Martins, to the right and left of that, two Ferraris, and the right as book, book, book matched, I guess, um, we had two Rolls Royces. And so when they pulled in, I think I had them hello, sort of Jerry Maguire style. They saw the garage, they saw the merchandising of the driveway, the fountains. It was a beautiful five acre property. And I, and I, I really believe that they, they made the buying decision before they even walked into the home and they walked into the home. The home was really set properly. My client then, um, and, my, and he's a client today, we understood merchandising. He really understood that homes need to be merchandised. Some people call it staging. I call it merchandising. And what we did was everything in the house was in absolutely a game uh, condition, even the bar, you know, we merchandised the bar with Louis the 13th cognac in 1942. And, 
you know, the Johnny Blue and the best of the best. So the feeling that they got coming from their palace in Shanghai to New York was a feeling of opulence. And it resonated with that couple and it led to a record breaking sale. Um, and that developer, believe it or not, because I went above and beyond and because we achieved this great number, he had turned out to be that same developer who built multiple homes in the Platinum Triangle in California, which is Bel Air, Beverly Hills, and Homie Hills, and ultimately is the guy with the $250 million listing. So it starts somewhere. Um, you got to work your, you know, your butt off. Uh, but you know, in my life, I do everything at the highest level possible. I just recently did an event in New York at a $40 million property in a place called the Westbury. And again, you know, we serve Louis the 13th as our drink of choice. So, um, can I interrupt you for a moment? Going back to that story that you told me, that's pretty incredible. Did you have more buyers than just this one lined up? And, uh, that I, I would imagine there was a significant, uh, cost involved. So there was a risk. If they say no, you're getting a Rolls Royce, Tiffany, uh, bracelets or whatever that was setting all the cars up. Like it's not something that you just set it and forget it. It had to be catered to them coming. Yeah. I designed that showing for that couple learning a lot about them when I did visit with them in China and it was a significant expense, but you know, it's a significant home with a significant commission. So you know, you have to spend money to make money. And uh, certainly we did. It wasn't really crazy. I mean, you know, you get a Rolls Royce of the day, it's 500, a thousand bucks. You get um, the, the jewelry. I think those keys are no more than $250 a piece. So there goes another $500. The client, because it was his house and his cars, that was easy. And the bar, of course, because we, um, we went shopping and did it recently again. Uh, with, with the person who bought the house, because that house is going back to market now. Um, we did it again. We went shopping for alcohol, probably spent $2,500 uh, plus the Bluey, another three grand. Um, probably spent $5,500 to, again, merchandise the bar. But at the end of the day, you know, it's not going to waste. I'm sure you would join me in a drink at this house anytime. Uh, <laughs> Any place, any time. But um, yeah, so it's worth the outlay. You got to know who your client is. And it, it's certainly worth the expense. You can't do it on every single showing. I just knew. How that, how, how but, much, like what would you give it a percentage? How confident you were that this is the right buyer for this home? I was pretty confident getting to understand their lifestyle in China and seeing how they, um, how they entertain my, me. Because when you go to China, I've been to China a dozen times. The, the... The clients there, they want to entertain you. They want to flex a little bit. You know, they do flex like, you know, Chinese, his flex is the type of what he's wearing, his watch, maybe his cars, depending upon where he is. It's a lot more flashy in places like Shanghai than it is in Beijing, how they live. But I got it. I understood that, you know, this was a boss. This guy was a boss, no joke. And I needed to treat him like a boss and treat him like royalty. And we did. And it ultimately resulted in a sale. And then from that deal, there's so many other 10 plus million dollar houses that homeowners approached me on because they knew what I would do in order to secure a buyer. And there's no expense that I wouldn't, um, if, I, if I felt it was going to have a positive result, there's no expense I wouldn't go to. And I started to develop a reputation of spending more money per household to get my home sold than my competition. And I do believe that the agent who hangs the sign on the front lawn, puts the house on the MLS and expects the third party community to bring the buyer is just wasting their time. I mean, we've made a practice out of double siding the majority of our deals. And all, and certainly every agent wants to not only list the property, but also attract and bring the buyer to closing. And our percentages are way higher than our competitors of actually not only representing the seller, but also bringing the buyer. And it really comes down to doing the work and putting your money where your mouth is and having the best net out there, again, to attract that big fish and, and close that deal. So, uh, you know, I have a very unique perspective to see what agents are doing because we work with literally thousands of agents nationwide. Any, anywhere from uh, selling small listings to uh, $100 million listings. And one thing, common denominator that I notice is agents are afraid to spend money. It's uh, it's a risk. It's, it's a gamble. 
they're afraid they're going to lose a listing. And the higher the price of the home, the higher that risk is. There's a lot of turnover and losing those listings. And typically, agents will spend the money maybe listing the house to a certain degree, to a certain level. In your case, not only did you spend money to list the home, but also attracting a buyer. And that's very unique. I don't see that very, very, uh, it's not commonplace. Uh, you know, I think, I think it comes down to, and I'm going to tell you the psychology behind my own company before I sold it, and also the psychology of Nest Seekers, which I happen to be the president of the ultra luxury division there, is that um, when you make the real estate agent responsible for the marketing, the marketing doesn't get done. And your average agent will go into his pocket when he first lists the house, he'll pay for photography, maybe he'll do a world class lifestyle video, um, and maybe some brochures, some postcards. But, you know, after the after a month or two or three months, they get tired of writing those checks. When I had my firm, Sean Elliott, what I would do is I would take the hands of the marketing out of the real estate agent's hands. Maybe they wouldn't get that crazy split that's offered by companies like KW or Remax or some of those blue collar companies. But, um, but I would take the marketing out of their hands and we would pay for all the marketing on behalf of our clients because we never, you could have an agent who's really super talented um, and you could have an agent you know, who's not, but take the agent who's super talented, but doesn't have a war chest of money. I never wanted my client to be compromised based on the financial well-being of the real estate agent so that, you know, we have more of a six month to 12 month plan where if you list with me for 12 months, I'm going to have something new and activated on a monthly basis. So for the first month, maybe it's a Instagram live it's some type of social media live. Maybe the second month, it's an event. Maybe the third month, it's two pages in like Hamptons Magazine. Maybe in month number four, um, it's a broker open, but you know maybe only to the top one percent of one percent or something. So we're doing it different. We're doing we're very strategic, and the and and again, it's if the marketing is left in the hands of the agent, and some agents do have a war chest of money, but they have a problem writing checks. It's the client that suffers. So I took it away from the agent at Sean Elliott. At Nest Seekers, we pretty much take it away from the agent as well. We do spend uh, a lot more money marketing our properties than our competition. But at the end of the day, you know, we're trying to track that buyer. And when I said about my current, my current practice and my previous practice when I had my own firm is that we double side more deals than anyone. And it's because we do the work. We do the marketing. We, make, we, we, we have the spend. And we get a return on those investments and in the form of results. Yeah, I think, you know, listing a property, it's not easy to get a listing, obviously, but listing it itself, it's somewhat, anybody can do it if you hire the right people. It's on top of the fact that you list the properties to attract the right buyer, that that's really, I think, where the, the, your secret sauce is. That that's extremely difficult, first of all, to replicate and, and to do. And you have to have a certain sense of knowledge of who to attract, who to go after. And one of the things that I remember that you did for 924 Bel Air, you created those booklets that were ridiculously expensive. Uh, and you distributed them to like all the billionaires that, that you you were aware of, which is pretty pretty smart, incredible, out of the box thinking. And for your client, like you're going way above what everybody else is doing. Um, can we actually talk about those booklets a little bit? We can. So um, one of the things, and I have to give the credit to the developer, you know, he had the same type of psychology as I have. You know, how much money is, is an agent or a team going to spend on marketing a property? And we had a world-class team of other agents, not just myself, on that, on that listing. He basically said, listen, this is a $250 million house. I'm going to put 1% aside for marketing, giving us a $2.5 million budget to wow. market the house. The books I'm, that you're talking about were, there were three books in a black box. And the, block, the box, the name on the box was Billionaire. I remember. And, I might still have it somewhere in the office. It was amazing. Yeah, I might even have one in my own personal office that I'm in right now. And it was called Billionaire. And the book weighed or the box weighed 15 pounds and I'm peddling now this going door to door, like a door to door salesman in that box was three books. One was photographs and descriptions about the house. Uh, the second one was all about the art installations and the art that was in the house. And the third book, because it was going to billionaires outside of California as well, 
was a hundred reasons why you would want to live in California, you know, from having like Disneyland to having, um, you know, the Emmy Awards, the Golden Globes, the, the Oscars to, you know, world-class beaches to, you know, the nice thing about living in LA is if I want to be snowboarding, I can get in my car and I can be snowboarding in the Fraser Mountains in 90 minutes, or I can be surfing in Malibu in 40 minutes when you live in LA. So, uh, I mean, a hundred reasons why. So if you were a billionaire and we presented you this book, and if I tell you how many secretaries of CEOs I snuck around to deliver this material directly to the CEO and their desk, um, this billionaire, it's, it's countless. And we, I, I, we, we went through Texas from Dallas to Houston in the middle of the night, but during the day delivering our material to against the audience most suited to purchase it, which was the billionaire community, one by one, billionaire by billionaire. I mean, I remember going to stadiums, you know, you know, that most sports franchises are owned by billionaires and going to, uh, you know, Texas Ranger Stadium. Um, I remember going to Dallas Cowboy Stadium, delivering to the, and in fact, while I was in Dallas, I went to a Mavericks game uh, because the Dallas Mavericks were owned by Mark Cuban. I thought Mark Cuban was the ultimate buyer for this particular house. Did you and end up meeting him? So I spent $2,500 for a floor seat at a Mavericks game. There, there are 55 home games in the NBA. The one home game I decided to buy a floor seat at is the one home game that Mark Cuban didn't attend. Oh my but God. I didn't give up. I left. Him, I grabbed like five of Mark Cuban's hottest cheerleaders and I took a photo with them holding this 15-pound book in my hands called Billionaire. I have the shot. Called my marketing department in New York and said, hey, do me a favor. Um, take a snapshot of my driver's license and make this little card saying something like, hi, Mark, I came all the way here from New York to get 15 minutes of your time to show you the most expensive, most spectacular home ever built in the uh, United States. I just need 15 minutes of your time. I will be in Dallas all weekend with my phone number. And I left it with the cheerleaders and they left it at his office at the stadium um, with a Mavericks play. And, um, and that didn't go over. So then I went to Maverick headquarters, which is also in Dallas. I went to the, where the, you know, the operation is really being run, walked in there. Mark wasn't in his office and left another book there. So I'm now up to $1,800 <laughs> in investment. And then finally it was Halloween. This goes back like seven years ago. I found out where Mark Cuban lives and I went to his house on Halloween trick or treating with a 15 pound bag and delivered it directly to his security guards. Not 10 minutes later, did the phone ring from an unknown number. It was Mark Cuban telling me I was crazy, but um, <laughs> that he would never buy a house in California because of uh, because the taxes or whatever, but he likes his setup in New York. Uh, sorry, the fact that you got a call yeah. back from him, <laughs> that speaks yeah. volumes. Yeah. You know, a lot yeah. of people are shy to just knock on a door to try to speak a l regular homeowner, but to, to really pursue somebody like that with that tenacity, that uh, perseverance. That's yeah, why do you do York. what you do. That's why yeah, you, we did you it have those listings. We did it from New York City to where dogs um, in these big buildings, like I went and delivered a, uh, a book to Michael Bloomberg, where like to get into the building, if you had anything, they had to be like, you know, it was like they thought it was a bomb because it weighed so much. And to a, to a CEO like that, to the Hamptons on Meadow Lane, delivering the books one by one to each house on Meadow Lane, the gated community, to then Miami, you know, to places like Indian Creek, where Bezos just spent $79 million, all the way to Palm Beach, to, you know, places like, you know, South County, North County Road next to uh, next to uh, Trump's place at Mar-a-Lago. I mean, you know, I mean, one by one, billionaire by billionaire, really, you know, trying to, 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 to again, you know, put it in the hands of someone that could uh, ultimately afford it. And it did result to a lot of showings. It really did. And ultimately, not that buyer, but uh, it did result in offers and it did result in uh, in an amazing experience. Well, not, not only are you looking for buyers, but the bigger picture is that people a lot of the times miss. You're marketing yourself. You're building a database of the most wealthiest buyers in the entire world that's something that's going to be with you for the rest of your life. And uh, you put your name out there. Now they know you. Now the next listing comes, hey, that's the Sean Elliott that brought me a billion dollar house. I mean, billion dollar brochure, whatever it is. It's That's the out, out of the box thinking.
that I think really makes you special. And uh, that's why I have you on the podcast. <laughs> One Love other it. story you told me the other day, which was very fascinating, how you went on a yacht. Where was it? In Cannes, Cannes right in France? And, yeah, actually, uh, in uh, Monaco, yeah. Monaco. So tell me a little bit about that, because that was, I think, phenomenal. Again, you know, listen, I think door knocking is the greatest thing in the world. I think if you want something, you got to go get it. And door knocking is clearly... Uh, one way that agents get listings um, and customers, you never know who's going to answer that door. This but, is a um, next level door. Yeah, knocking. this is a little bit different. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I attend the Yacht Show, uh, the Formula One, the Cannes Film Festival. I spend a lot of time in the south of France because the whole world of wealth descends on the Monaco Yacht Show during four days. And my, my, my clients and my homes are very expensive. So, you know, how do you reach this like... Uh, consolidated um uh group you know of uh of wealth how do you do that and, you know you got to put yourself in those places like davos in switzerland two weeks ago the super bowl will be in las vegas i'll be there um first week of february uh or actually next sunday and you just got to go where your clients go and i do work the marina in quite a way with the big mega yachts but some of the biggest boats are too big to be uh, come into port. So they're anchored out in the Mediterranean. And the only way that uh, the owners and their crew and their guests get into shore is what's called a tender. And today's tenders are a lot different than they were 10 years ago. They used to be a big raft, you know, with an engine on the back. Now tenders are two, $3 million. So I rented a tender um, this past September and took that tender with a captain into the med and a different type of presentation, not a 15 pound one, but one that I made like an iPad and went from mega yacht to mega yacht on this tender, actually throwing like a fizz, frisbee to the crew. Um, and you showed and, me what you were throwing. That thing by itself was pretty unique. It was yeah. like a booklet that had like videos playing in it. It's very, very cool. It It, it, it is. It's, it was highlighting my top eight properties so that I took uh, maybe two or three listings from Los Angeles. To there was some of my footage there too, right? I think Mend Mendocino. Uh, uh, and... Yeah, Montecito. Absolutely. absolutely. Took all the top listings, 30-second clips apiece. So I didn't want to bore anybody. It's like four four minutes of just the most spectacular homes in the U.S. and, and, and in, in Europe. Uh, and and, and hand-delivered it, uh, basically, again, once again, to the audience most suited to purchase our properties. Yeah, it, it, you know, and it, at the same time, it, it's it's a lot of fun. So, I, you know, I make a lot of noise. I try to get directly to the buyer uh, or who I think the buyer might be for specific properties. And, you know, the air is really thin at the top. There's, you know, when you're selling a house for a million dollars or even $10 million, you don't know who the buyer is going to be. You have no clue, basically. But when you're selling a house for $250 million, you're going to know who the buyer is. It's, there's right. only 3,000 people in the world that have a net worth of a billion dollars or more. A thousand of them. But even people, knowing them th th doesn't really help you because finding where they are at any given time is almost impossible. They go through great lengths to conceal their location, but that was just great out of the box thinking going on a yacht show you. where all the mega thank yachts you. are. Thank you. So I, I feel like that's kind of uh, your your other side is like the out of the box thinking and that also translates into exposure and social media. I think you understand that a lot better than most other people. For example, on that very last listing uh, that you currently have, the 1200 Bel Air, you got negotiated a deal for Mr. Beast to come out there and, and use it to film uh, in one of his videos that today I believe that's probably the most watched real estate video ever in history. How many views it does it have now? Like 150 million something? In yeah, it, it, absolutely. And our Zillow numbers were astronomical. We have the record today of the highest views of any property, single family property in the world um, with 1200 Bel Air Road. We had um, more than uh, 200,000 views on Zillow with probably, I don't know, 20,000 saves, maybe 10,000 forwards and shares. I mean, crazy numbers. And that's my job, right? Is to bring as many eyes on a property as humanly possible. We certainly knocked it out of the park with that one. Prior to that, I had one from six or seven years ago, which was also before big YouTubers like 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 Jimmy. 
uh, 20 million views on 924 Bel Air Road from a YouTube video I did with a ex associate of my firm. So I would say that, you know, getting the right eyes are important. You got to get eyes on a property and, you know, everyone's on Instagram, you know, whether you're a, a 15 year old kid or a 50 year old billionaire, a lot of people are on Instagram. Maybe they don't have their own account. Maybe they have an account. Maybe it's private, but they're out there looking because it's now like reading a newspaper. You know, it's just like flipping through your interests. You, you, you follow people and you follow things that interest you. And sometimes you get lucky. In my case, I do promote a lot of my properties and I promote them to a demographic that I think will ultimately be my buyer. So I use social media for a number of reasons. Uh, but I'm always using it to pitch the property and not myself. What will happen to me will happen anyway. But the right thing to do, unlike a lot of real, real estate brokers, and you know there are a lot of very successful real estate brokers out there who've done really well in leveraged television shows, and I give them a lot of credit and bravo to all of them. But they're really out there promoting themselves and not their properties. And my philosophy is promote your properties and they'll sell. So I take a different approach. Their approach, and again, Bravo to their success, but they're out there creating content on a daily basis. They, what they do, they're content creators. Are they really out there trying to get their listings sold? I don't think so. I think they're trying to get themselves sold. And I right. think if you if you truly promote your properties, you will be promoting yourself at the same time. I mean, the, the work speaks for itself. Uh, people will hire you based on the results and that will prop up your name. Your name is being elevated, not just because you're in front of the camera, but because the results that it carried with it. And that's a lot more important for a seller. That's a billionaire that has a one of a kind property. That's really hard to flip. Celebrity might not sell the pro property. It's an expert that knows how to leverage celebrities and, and high level of exposures to, to promote the property, which is very important. And speaking of which you also, um, uh, for example, for the second video that we did together, um, uh, negotiate a deal with a really nice influencer. She has a six over 6 million followers to make a lifestyle video for the property. And that video itself went viral and got a ton of views. Correct. So we got like over a million views, one and a half million, something like that. Yeah, we're, thousand likes. We're, at, we're actually 1.8 million views right now on that video, which is amazing. I'm sure we'll break 2 million at some point. And if you're going to hire a model, a beautiful model for your property shoot to do a lifestyle video, why not hire one who's also an influencer at the tanks? Why not hire one that's an influencer at the same time? Yeah. And she's got 6.5 million followers. Uh, I collabed with her. Yeah, Veronica is quite often in the news that she was uh, some I interesting articles that she's out there and she's constantly people are publishing about her. It's not just a model. It's somebody that's actually out. In yeah, the news quite it's often. an influencer and it could attract. I'm sure there are a lot of very wealthy people, men, women. I hate to say it, maybe profile more men who are following her, her, uh, her page, you know, but again, you know, rich or poor. You know, she's got a lot of followers and I know that if I collaborate with people like her and I've got a number of them that there's a high likelihood that maybe someone will see the video and love the home. And I, I think right now there is someone interested in that particular property who um, didn't just flip through and find that video, but has been a follower of mine for a while and saw the video and just got turned on by the work that you did. The cinematography was on point. The music was exceptional. It really kept your interest, whether it was, you know, two minutes, three minutes or four minutes. And I believe just feel inside with no conversation to the client, that client watched that video over and over again. I know they did. And for whatever reason, they, they watched it, but it kept basically cementing an impression in their mind that this is something I'd like to own. And as a result, it did result in a showing. And I can't say I know this for sure, but I just have a really strong feeling about it. I'm crossing my fingers. I hope you sell this one. It's yeah. uh, it's going to be another record, and uh, it's going to be really fascinating to see. Uh, there is a significant there is a significant offer on that property right now. Which uh, uh, video was uh, the one that they watched more often? The shorter version or the longer one? I would imagine yeah. the longer, probably because it showed more things. I think also I think, the music. I think was, it's the opposite. I think it was the, the shorter one. one. 
the short and vertical one, um, where I think I introduced the house, I talk about Justin Timberlake and so on, and then it starts. It's like the video, I do an intro, and then the video takes off with an amazing song, very, very um, high energy, and then into the house and all the amenities. And I really believe that that video, um, again, because the richer you are, the less patience you have. Uh, no one's going to sit down and watch a four-minute video, a five-minute video. Uh, they could, but this video, again, no more than a couple of minutes, really did, I believe, capture the house at its best and also was able to show off all the amenities. And this is a very amenity-driven home. And I think that showing off the home's amenities really did hopefully hook this buyer. Yeah, uh, I, I hope it, it will give the desired result. But either way, even just the exposure alone, a lot of people don't realize, even from your seller's point of view, your seller is a developer. Uh, they're building a brand for themselves as well. They want to be known for that, the, the hot house. Uh, it's kind of a branding for them as well, branding play. Because after this house, they have another one and another one and another one. And when people will hear, oh, this is built by this person, then it gives them already automatic attraction. It's like, you know, sure. the reason why Ab people want to buy Tiffany versus some other jeweler is the yeah. brand. A the brand is everything. Absolutely. The more yeah. people know about know about the brand, the better. And and in making all of that video, uh, it was really great working with you because you had the vision to kind of what you wanted to see and we collaborated together. Uh, the difficulty for my side was it to condense it into that two minute format or one minute format, the out of like 60 minutes worth of footage is incredibly hard. Uh, I don't think people realize how much work goes into that. Oh, two minute video takes an hour. No, I think it took us about three weeks to make it. And I had to personally get involved in that. I usually don't get involved in our post production. I have way too many things to do. But in that one, I wanted to put my own touch into it. And uh, I think it turned out really well. I'm, I'm very proud of it. And I hope we do a lot more. And this brings a lot more uh, a lot more business for you as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I hope so. You nailed that one. And again, you know, I know it took weeks to put together, but it was well worth it. I don't think any other media company would spend that type of time to make something so great. But at the end of the day, nothing comes easy. And the more work you put into things, the more results you get. And that one really was my one of my favorite of all time. So I wanted to actually ask you a little bit about nest seekers because that's also part of your part of your work, and I think you have a very unique position where uh, you're based out of New York, but you travel to LA, you travel to Europe, you you go everywhere. A lot of twenty year olds don't have as much energy to do these things, and I think that also is a very important point for people to realize that opportunity does not come to those that just sit around and, and wait for it. You have to be in, in every place at once. And the fact that you're capable of traveling nonstop, I, I think I'm a little bit younger than you, but I have, I think, less energy than you <laughs> flying back from that's New York right. to, to LA like every other week. That, that's, that's pretty amazing. How do you do it? How are you capable of just traveling? You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't phase me. To me, the travel part is the easy part, and it's a great time to reflect and strategize about what we're going to do when we get there, right? So, you know, if I if I have a week in LA, and you know, for example, I was there last week, I make sure that I cover every stone and that I uncover every stone as well. I mean, I use every single minute, but I use that six hours from New York to LAX to manifest what I think will be the ultimate week um, in in getting things accomplished. And uh, when I'm there, just making sure I put myself in places I need to be, positions of opportunity, because you never know. I, I mean, I meet clients all the time. I met one recently at the Polo Lounge in the Beverly Hills Hotel just by having lunch there. Now, I could have had lunch at um, Chick-fil-A, which I happen to love, you know, or I could have had lunch anywhere necessarily. But I choose to have lunch in places where uh, my clients have lunch or my potential clients have lunch, right? Uh, or my current clients or my previous clients because I want to be in um, top of mind let's say, when it comes to maybe buying a property or selling a property worldwide. So I do spend a lot of time in New York and I, I, I do 
uh, transact a lot in New York City as well as the Hamptons. And I spent a lot of time uh, in Florida, uh, a lot of time in Miami Beach and a lot of time in Palm Beach. And they're two very different customers, as well as I spent a tremendous amount of time in California. I'm the broker of record for our Beverly Hills office for the state of California. Uh, a lot of time in Beverly Hills, Bel Air, the Platinum Triangle, a lot of time in Malibu. Uh, you know, I always say Malibu to Montecito, Bel Air to Beverly Hills. And I just feel that that's my jam. It's a triangle of wealth. People that have homes in Palm Beach could have a house in Malibu, could clearly have an apartment in New York City or a pet a -tear, clearly a house in the Hamptons. And maybe now the trend is, there's a huge amount of Americans descending on the Cote d'Azur, descending on the French Riviera. So saw that trend coming, like I saw the Chinese trim, uh, like I saw the, the Chinese, uh, uh, same, same thing happening, the trend. Um, and, you know, going for it. I have two trophy properties in the south of France right now, one in a place called Cap d'Ai, which is about, seven minutes from Monte Carlo and Monaco with the most amazing views of the Mediterranean. That house, if anyone's listening, is 118 million euro and is a one of a kind property. And then I have another one in Saint Tropez in the um, in the most affluent community and the safest community in all of Saint Tropez, right next to Bernard Arnault, a guy named uh, Lawrence Graff. Uh, from Graf Jewelers and a guy named Marciano, who is guest jeans. And then my property sits uh, right next to those four guys on Billionaire's Row in St. Tropez. And that was 100 million euros. So, uh, and you I have a good video on it? Uh, I, I don't have video because we're, we're a little off market on that one. We're keeping that one a little quiet. We don't, over, we, we don't want to overexpose that one. But we are doing some fun things in the near future to promote that property in, in France, which is kind of cool. Um, but um, I don't have any photos other than it's very, very, very special and exclusive. And uh, it's nice to be trading now outside the U.S. You know, that that's, I was just thinking about this. So cool that your buyers are in, in a unique position. They, they obviously have a ton of different properties and they have properties globally. So if you're capable of uh, having a successful tra transaction with somebody that will have a very positive interaction uh, they're more likely to come to you again for another transaction elsewhere. So even if you sell a house in Bel Air, you might sell to the same buyer potentially something in France, and that's very unique. It's not common that like somebody, a real estate agent, sells a house in uh, LA and then sells a house across the world to the same buyer. That's not many people can do that. It's trust. It's also trust, understanding value, understanding markets. It. it I can't even believe sometimes I could talk about New York City. I could talk about the Hamptons. I could talk about Palm Beach, Miami, Bel Air, Beverly Hills. And now I spent, uh, I would say last year I was in Europe about eight times inside 12 months. And I would say of those eight times, five of them were just between, let's say, May and September. I was in, I was in Europe or predominantly the French Riviera five times in that short period of time. Again, from New York's JFK, it's seven and a half hours. You're at Nice Airport, and from Nice, you're in a car, and you're in Cannes in 10 minutes, and you're up driving up the French Riviera. It's not a big deal to me, uh, as long as it's a direct flight. You know, it is what it is. Strategize, meditate, um, sleep, you know, whatever it takes. Um, l let's talk a little bit about uh, nest seekers in general, because uh, we kind of started there and we veered off topic a little bit. I started talking about travel, but nest seekers is a very unique organization that it does follow the same principle that you mentioned you followed before you sold your company to nest seekers. And now you're president of the luxury division, correct? At nest seekers. So the fact that nest seekers pays for all the advertising, I think that's very clever. I think more brokerages should do that because it, lets the buy that lets the realtor do what they do best which is networking and connecting with a customer and and doing all the things around the house they're not marketers and they're sometimes afraid to spend money and this is a very clever clever solution and i'd love to have one day maybe also eddie the ceo of uh of uh, nest seekers on the podcast maybe we can do one together one day because uh, I, I really find Nest Seekers also fascinating, Brent. And now you guys are moving also into luxury yachts. Is that it? 
We are. We uh, started about a year ago. We started a company called Nest Yachts, and I actually sold um, the first Nest Yacht, which I'm excited about. It was a 85 foot Ferretti, a $10 million boat. But that's someone, believe it or not, I met in the Hamptons. They flew to Monaco um, because they had never been to the yacht show and they were looking for a yacht. And I. Uh, spent a couple nights entertaining them. We were entertaining each other in, in, in Monaco. And a year later, they bought a boat from us in Florida. So wow. it just they started with looking for homes in the Hamptons. Then we got to spend some time to socialize in the south of France. Hence, um, a year later, they bought a boat from us in Miami. So, you know, it's relationship driven. Once you built uh, the database of wealthy customers, I guess everything else becomes connected. Uh, yeah, it, I think so. And and again, you formulate that trust. And the trust is everything. I do for a client. There's it, nothing I wouldn't do for a client. Absolutely, it's very hard to find somebody that you can trust and not just trust. Also, have the knowledge and the connections to go out, seek new opportunities, find great deals for for them. Um, yeah, and. What about how do new agents now come in into nest seekers? You guys primarily uh, do. I, I think we, we work a lot with nest seekers, and most of the homes that I see are actually luxury homes. How do you recruit new agents to join nest, nest seekers, or do they so come to it, you? It, 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 they really do come to us. I, I think that all real estate firms, with the exception of going out and recruiting, which is something that all good real estate firms do, they have a. Um, usually like a department that just recruits all day long, but uh, the majority of the agents that I work with or sign off on come to us and we're very selective on who we hire. We just don't want agents like in the past, just for agent count who have a heartbeat, you know, and, um, you know, don't amount to be much of anything. You have to, the agent, you can see potential in people. They have a spark, they have a way about them. You know, 50% of this business is being likable. And if you're a likable person, people want to do business with you. And that's how it works. So, you know, if I see that there's um, a, a candidate, they maybe just got their license, but they're really likable, that's 50% of it. And the other 50% is follow up, follow through, being tenacious, uh, obviously work ethic, right? You know, what do they look like? What do they speak like? Do they dress the part? You know, I say fake it till you make it, dress the part, dress to impress. Um, you know, really work on your style because unfortunately we're in a world of perception and people perceive you to be successful based on a lot of things. Certainly um, how you speak, if you're polished and well-rounded uh, and you're likable, that's a great start the way you look, your appearance, you know, the type of suits you're wearing, um, the type of jewelry you're wearing, nothing has to be expensive, even down to like a manicure, right? Like a woman should always have a perfect manicure. I'm a guy of a perfect manicure, right? But again, you know, it could be the smallest thing that either turns someone on or turns someone off. And I think that you just have to do your best to put your best foot forward. Nice. Um, and then one last question before we wrap up. Um, I may be praising you a lot in this podcast, uh, but that's that's very true. All the things that I say, I mean it. People that know me, they know that I don't just praise people uh, just because. I, I truly do respect you. And one of the qualities that I like the most in you is that you're a very simple, humble person. Uh, I work with a lot of agents that are also uh, on your level that do have huge listings. And let's just say it's not always easy to talk to them. Uh, they're not down to earth. And this may be my observation. I want to get your opinion on this. I think part of the reason why you are like this is because you also have a level of spirituality that that you kind of carry in your life. Uh, you believe that there is a higher power, correct? Like, and And I think that's really helpful for anybody in business to realize there's something always above your head. Kind of keeps you in check. Uh, that you have to be honest with other people. Everything that we do is being watched. Everything that we say is being heard. Everything we, we, we do in life is being recorded. And you always have to do an accounting in life. It's not always about the money. And we also have to recognize that the success doesn't just come from our own efforts. We can do, uh, you even mentioned in this podcast, you got lucky. That's, 
we call it uh you know divine providence so to speak but god helps to those that are doers they're workers but there's always a level of uh, i think blessing that comes from the spiritual world that's very important and people miss out on can you speak a little bit how that's impacting your life yeah i think if you have to believe in the higher power it's out there um you can work very very hard and you know i call it luck you call it something else the divine power but i think we're talking about the same thing and yeah i think what you put in you get in return once in a while you get that extra muzzle of that luck and that just is the perfect storm you got to give back to your community and again i'm talking about all communities in some way i do that i'm very philanthropic i give back in so many different ways and you have to be able to talk to the higher uh in some way as well and you know not be afraid to ask for stuff and you know make deals in return and all of that and that came into my life in the last five years more so talking to people that don't exist at the highest level um but ultimately sometimes getting that uh that what you be careful what you wish for because sometimes it comes true well um i think with that we just running out of time i can talk to you for hours more and i definitely would love to have you again back at the podcast next time in person hopefully uh it's always a, a pleasure um uh, where can people find you, you if... i mean listen you, you went i i give my cell phone to everyone it's 516-695 six three four nine you can find me at sean elliott.com you can find me at blackbookre.com you can find me um you can email me at sean elliott at nestseekers.com and um, or, or check really, out his instagram he has like three hundred thousand yeah. followers there yeah we're, we're really doing well on instagram it's been 10 years though i mean you know people are like well how do you get 350 50 000 followers and it took 10 years you know, it wasn't like I, I you know, I, I hate to say it. I started in a hospital bed. I got into a car accident and I, I have to work 24 hours, seven days a week. I just can't stop even that car accident back on uh, Hurricane Sandy back in 13. You know, once I was able to uh, function properly, it was uh, me saying, you know, let's start an Instagram account and one follower at a time, one post at a time. It's really now been 10 years since I started that account. And if you... If you go ahead and you post quality content, you'll get great uh, traction and then traction leads to followers and, and so on. Yeah. Well, again, thank you very much. I wish you much more success in your life. You already have it, but may God give you success in personal life for your children, for your whole family, always healthy, always happy, fulfilling spiritual life and uh, obviously sell every single property that you get very quickly for the highest dollar and get many many more of them and i love uh, that uh, i hope to see you when you come back to la give me a call we'll get some lunch and Let's maybe work on the next listing thank I you so much that. for thank joining you. yeah thank you thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it it's a pleasure take care thank you everybody for watching please subscribe we'll post links uh to sean's instagram page definitely check him out and uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you so much.